Uh, this, is, this is a talk about some kind of works we are currently making uh, within my research group about uh, getting new or old programming models for parallel programming into a, a modern shape so they can be actually uh, be used and tested on different uh, new uh, architectures and stuff. So first a disclaimer. There is actually no boost product in this presentation, so you can stay where you are. <laughs> yeah, well, there is a few, but yeah. Well, like, like half the slide. So, uh, what are we trying to do in this, in this work? Uh, something that changed more or less recently is that now, most of the high performance computing systems uh, start to be more and more uh, complex again. Uh, by the <coughs> By the fact they are turning hybrid. So if you look at the top 500 stuff, you will count that more than, well, it's more like 90% now of all <laughs> these machines are at least clusters of multi cores. And if you look at the top 10, everything in the top 10 is clusters of multi cores, the GPU, and or cell processors, or whatever custom accelerators that can basically be found. And when you go to Walmart or whatever, uh, find, buying uh, a new computer, it's basically a small HPC node because you have at least quad cores, uh, a huge amount of frames, and a huge GPU, which is basically putting to shame uh, any clusters from the last 10 years. So the question is, okay, so we got this all new power uh, that appears again. So is the free energy free again or not? Well, uh, the difficulty is, it then disappeared. They just shifted from one part of the problem to another one. And basically now, even if we start actually mastering uh, multi cores in themselves, GPU in themselves, when you start putting everything together back and trying to make this kind of patchwork of architectures works, it starts to be complex again. And the fact is that if I throw more um, stuff into my systems, does it mean that I actually go faster or not? And the irony of this thing is that when we look at the lecture tools, there's a lot of people that say, yeah, when I have hybrid systems, and I use, for example, uh, MPI and OpenMP to program the stuff, it go faster. Nice. But you have an equal number of papers that say, oh, yeah, we try using MP MPI and OpenMP, and uh, it's bad. <coughs> so uh, the question is, what the heck is going on? Well, it's a complex problem for a lot of reasons. If you look at just the architecture levels, there is a lot more um, parameters to take into account, okay. and the application uh, still has the complex part also, and basically when you start mixing programming models, well, instead of having one or two choice, you end up with a gazillion combination possible, and finding which one can be the best one out of all of this is quite uh, a daunting task. So the idea is to say, okay, well, it's complex. Can we find some kind of models that actually hide all this crap under the carpet? And so we can actually just try to experiment with different kind of uh, parallel uh, hybrid systems. And can we get something which is at, at least decent so we can actually get meaningful information from these experiments? So uh, what we present there is one of the, it's a try, well, it's a tentative work that tried to assess this. So we went, find, we went to find some kind of programming model, which is not that new, but we found that it fits the problems. And we actually implemented it into a C++ library for this kind of parallel required programming. Uh, we had a small tool to up in this huge configuration exploration mess. And if, of course, if I'm there, just because we use boost all over this. So, I will go through some parts. I will speak about what kind of parallel programming models we can actually get, speak about the library, and give some example application with some uh, benchmarks and curves and stuff like that. So, uh, for a long time, and I'm thinking still again now, well, most of people dealing with this kind of machine basically have uh, a low level approach to how to program this. Okay? Uh, basically, you are running the clusters. Uh, well, I don't have any bucks there, but I think I can actually bet five or six dollars that most of cluster users use stuff like MPI or something that looks like, well, except two, but you are actually <laughs> an outlier, so it doesn't count. Uh, we have some set of 
Well, the model is based on sending messages from nodes to nodes, uh, either synchronously or asynchronously, and MPI provides a set of uh, ready-to-use, low-level, C-based, uh, with a lot of void pointers, communication primitives. Uh, it works, <laughs> and it worked it for a long time, but uh, the complexity of uh, application that you need to write now is start to be pushing a lot of pressure on this. And when you look at systems for multi-cores, well, it's look a bit better. There is a funding <coughs> key and there is a lot of efforts that looks like a lot like this, which is basically some extension to uh, a lot of languages that basically give us some primers, new primers that can say, okay, here is the start of a parallel sections, and I want you to start thread from there, duplicating this code over all the nodes, uh, all the threads, and do some stuff until I tell you we are finished. And we basically are able to write code that say, okay, this is in sequential part, this is parallel part, and then another sequential part. And there is a couple of functions to handle synchronizations and handling the number of active threads and stuff like that. But still low level. There is stuff by, I mean, I'm thinking about CVB and other low to mid level libraries that actually cover uh, a good uh, part of this kind of work. Except, well, when you want to manage uh, real life size applications, this can get quite fast for uh, every problem. So what we may want to do is, well, we don't want the users to have to care about the architectures and the programming model details. We want to have a way to estimate, or guess estimate in some case, uh, what, uh, what would be the actual runtime of our application. And we want something that the end users can actually manipulate in a way it doesn't uh, lose all these errors. So there is a lot of stuff going on. Stream processing, which is taking a large share of the stuff right now. And two old fogies, mainly Paris skeletons, which I already gave a talk about um, two years ago. And another old fogie, which is the Borg synchronous parallelism model, which will look a bit in details because, well, it has some fine properties. So what is uh, the Burke Synchronous Parallelism Model, or BSP. Well, it's dead from last century stuff, okay? It's basically a constraint, a very constrained parallel programming models. And uh, it builds, it takes advantage of these constraints to be able to provide an analytical uh, performance model of what's going on in the BSP program. It's basically based on three simple stuff. We have a machine model that would describe what variant called the BSP machine, the cost model for program running on these machines, and the programming model itself. So basically, what's a BSP machine? Well, nothing fancy. You have a couple of processing units with their local memory, which are best gathered with an all to all uh, interconnection network, which supports global and only global synchronization through some barrier mechanisms. Why is this? And in this model, what we want to have is the main parameters is n, which is the number of uh, processing units, and something we would call g, which is the uh, actual speed of the network. And how do we program this kind of machine? Well, the BSP uh, programming model is based on the concept of super steps. When you write a parallel program in BSP, what you're writing is a sequence of <coughs> parallel steps. Okay. And each step is basically a sequence of Asynchronous computation steps over all the process, uh, processors of the machines, which is followed by whole to all communication steps, following an arbitrary patterns of transmissions, and mandatory buyers there. Okay. And when everybody hits there, all the, all the data that gets transferred is considered to be available to the processor for starting the next parallel super steps. And when you want to build an application, you are basically putting super steps one after the other. And usually there is a point where someone in the back of the room raises his hand and says, What the heck, buyers? Okay, and yeah, you could do it. <laughs> yeah, what the heck, buyers? I, mean, uh, I was told that if I put too much buyers in my program, I would lose scalability. Yes, this is true. But from now, we don't give a crap. <laughs> and we will see how it can be not that much of a problem. But yeah, we, are, we know that, don't worry. So, asynchronous computation, transmission in whatever order you want, synchronization over all uh, the systems. But, well, if we have that, basically, 
if we if we say that W i is a commutation time on processor i, and that each processor transfer in a in global way h bytes for super steps with the throughput of the network for z and spend l uh, seconds performing a buyer, this function gives us the cost of the super steps, which is basically the maximum of, a, of the workload of all processes, the time spent communicating there, and the time for the buyer. And usually, W high is itself some kind of analytical function you know about, or you can estimate using some kind of big notation in the worst case, or you can actually measure experimentally. So everything there is accessible at some point, and when you design your algorithm, you are about to say, okay, I have this five or six two steps, there is a WI for each of them, there is a, the type of communication I get, and there is a number of buyers, and you can derive a complete analytical function cost model for the program. And this is something that we actually want to have in our systems, because uh, our premise is that, well, we have these huge complex systems with multiple levels of uh, parallelisms going on, and there is no way we can actually just look at them like this and say, yeah, here is how I should put that. So the idea is to basically build on top of such a constraint model, which comes with this analytical function model, and say, okay, there is a way to write code in this model, that's the easy part, and there is a way to actually start from the description of an application as a super step sequences, and try to derive the complete analytical function that gives me the cost of um, the applications, and basically use this into an offline system that will compute whatever possibilities of computation, transfer, and number of buyers around those multiple levels of parallelisms, and try to divest, okay, this is the best way to do the stuff. So that's why we will basically sacrifice a bit of performance because of this, to get something that can actually manage to be uh, analyzed offline and that can actually help us getting some information about what's going on. Yes, Bryce? What if you want to do adaptive or dynamic parallelism? If you want to, you're not going to know um, what the best path will be until yeah. you've started running and until you started processing. Okay, so uh, the business level answer is, that's an interesting question, and I can tell you about afterwards. And the, well, the regular question is that, this is basically, uh, well, this is basically the raw BSP model. There is another model which is called the oblivious <coughs> BSP model, which basically takes care of this, and basically uh, this uh, can be represented by either something you don't know nothing about, and so you have basically building, uh, well, this turned into a function itself. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you have to feed whatever stuff you want, and you can basically recompute everything in the steps. Or, but nobody does that because it's a mess, instead of having one value there, you can have a stochastic matrices. Say, usually with this much prob probabilities, I'm taking this much time when I'm there, and this much time when I'm there, and you basically end up with a stochastic model. And people using MATLABs and fancy maths come down and sort of use a problem. Uh, there is extension to the BSP models that take care of this kind of stuff. Uh, well, we, work, we didn't went there right now because, well, it was not really our uh, main uh, target application, but yeah, there is extension to that. So, how does it look? Well, it's nothing new, as I say, it's that from the <coughs> last centuries. So there is a few application, uh, implementation of stuff. There is the uh, C-based BSPD from the uh, research group at Oxford, uh, which is no better than MPI because it provides too much uh, communication primitives, and every communication primitive is actually specialized, okay, and I'm speaking of C code, so you see what I mean when I say specialized, uh, on the actual uh, communication medium. So you have maybe six or seven communication primitives times three because one for MPI, one for chain memory, one for whatever. So it works, but it's all based on low level uh, constructions. And on the other hand of the spectrum, there is implementation of BSP in a functional language like Camel uh, that use, uh, well, the functional side of the languages to basically enforce the constraint of the model. And basically, it's far simpler. You have a notion of a parallel vector 
which is called a vector, but doesn't any, have anything to do with what we may call a vector, which is basically a distributed um, variables across the BSD machine. And we write, we write the program with basically three primitives, a synchronization primitives and two communication primitives that we will des describe a bit further. And everything is safe tied because it's all written in ML and uh, the ML interpreter are pretty bitch when we do stupid stuff. And it comes with an extended syntax uh, modules to actually handle all of this in the tiny fashion. And what we're looking at is can we implement some kind of this directly into C++ instead of having to do something like that and see, well, how far can we go with having some kind that basically look like a functional library. So, as I say, why BSP? Oh, well, I get the answer already. Well, the programming model is straightforward. It's a sequence of parallel segments. How do we handle hybridization called in this stuff? Well, every machine in the, mach in the BSP machine is able to run an arbitrary function. Okay. So now let's take an example. I got clusters of reticles. What should I do? Well, I have a first obvious B the BSP machine, which is a node. So I can run function on my MPI nodes. Okay. And this function can, in the black box way, completely contain another BSP machine, which is mapped over the cores on the node, and run itself into its own smaller BSP machine, which happens to have a faster barrier, because the barrier in OpenMP is far uh, faster than MPI. And you can actually lay out layers of BSP machine one into the others, and the GPU is just another BSP machine, which actually contains BSP machines themselves, etc., etc. And basically, you can black box your hybrid systems. We get an example afterwards. And you just put your low uh, I mean, lower level uh, parallel stuff into a function, you put into another one, you can put another one. And the model actually works without the problem because all the levels can have its own omega cost functions that get pushed into the other one, etc. Et There's a limited support for task parallelism, which is another problem. Uh, because of the barrier, if you try to write a pipeline, you will certainly fail. Well, you can write one, but I don't think it will be a real pipeline. And yeah, there is the impact of barrier costs. But we will see, in, well, the kind of application we had wasn't much of a problem. So, our idea is that, well, let's write a BSP like library in C that basically takes advantage of what the guy in MM did already and try to see how we can write something that explores this cost function stuff and try to explore this configuration space in an easy way. So, how does it look? Well, let's look at BSML a bit first. Okay, so, you have an Askel talk this afternoon, so there is a few camel talks this morning to warm you up. So, in BSP, we have this notion of distributed vector which is basically a, co a parallel container in which every element sits on the different processors of the BSP machine. And we have this funky uh, syntax in BSML that say, okay, when I do brackets, brackets, something inside, I'm building a parallel vector using whatever is V. And once I want to access the local value of V, I basically <coughs> uh, put V into this dollar stuff. And this gives me the local values of V on my local machines. And if you have a parallel vector that contains uh, elements of type alpha, the parallel vector type is part of alpha. This is a notation we will use for now. So, there is a function we have in BSP, <coughs> in BSM. The first function is the, project, the projection function, we need proj. That does the following one. Given the parallel vector V, okay, it does some communication, and at the other end of the communication, what you get back, what is this? It's a parallel vector of functions that take a need as a parameter and give you an alpha. And what it does is the following. Every element of the vectors is basically sent to all of the processes. Okay. It's basically, um, oh shit, I forgot. Uh, all gather, I guess, in MPI. Yeah, it should be. It's actually all gather in MPI, and what you get there is not, in fact, it's not an array, it's, it's a function. And by passing the PID 
a PIE value to the function you get, the value that the process PIE sends you back. So if you are on processor 1 and you ask for f of 0, you will get the value of the processor 0. And when you are on processor 2, you can get the other one, etc. And this is a function. Now, why is it a function? Because it's a more natural way of ending this kind of stuff in ML instead of having to write with a mutable array. But it's basically an array. It's a function that maps an integer to something else. So this is the first so the function, first, yeah. Uh, so all of these are transmitted over the network? Yeah. So everyone receives it, but chooses to ignore, so V2, uh, the second node ignores well, V1. Well, in fact, V2. everybody gets, everybody should have, okay, and you, and you get it when you ask it to get it. But everything is transmitted on the network. It's basically an MP, if, you, uh, if I was writing this in MPI, uh -huh. I would write an MPI all gazer. Okay. Because it's basically what it is. So it's basically, okay, let's take the value of the parent vector there, which is distributed, and turn it into a local value, which every value of the parent vector is locally uh, held by the processor. Oh. Uh, sorry, once more. So that's, it's, it's a multicast transmission then? Yes. Okay. Well, when multicast makes sense. I mean, in OpenMP, just you, everybody will write into a shared memory section okay. to fill out the matrices and do it okay. this way. But it's basically multicast, yes. And the second function is a bit more uh, complex. This is a generic call to all communication function, which can put. So what does put there? It takes a parent vector of functions that give from a PID some values, and it gives you back another parent vector of function of the same stuff. And basically, what does this function? For every processor, the function which is stored there will be told me, OK, what value should I send to PID i? Okay. And so for each PID, you basically fill this representation there locally. So for example, P1 sends V11 to processor 1 and V12 to processor 2, doesn't send anything to processor 3. P2 just sends V22 to itself, and P3, sorry, basically send one value to everybody. And what do we have as an output? It's a function that says, OK, if you give me a PID, I will tell you the values that this PID sent to you. And basically, sometimes if you, in your mind you can transpose this. And what will we end up is that I will end up with a function that gives me, okay, what does PID 1, 0, sorry, send to the processor 0? Well, it send V11. PID 1 doesn't send me anything. And PID 2 send me this. And the same for processor there. Okay. Uh, I failed, I guess. Yeah, 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 this one should be there. Okay. So much for me. And this one there. So we basically say, okay, here is all the stuff I want to send to everybody. I may send nothing. Okay. And the transmission is done in some kind of all to all fashions. And we basically send to everybody what it should receive from everybody. And basically, it's by playing with the function which is there that we can compute whatever kind of transfer we want, okay, and make it happen in one uh, huge global uh, communication step. This is well. This is the biggest. Um, well, this is one. Of the, this is the most complex uh, primitive of the stuff because you have this complete freedom of what is a function on the processors, and you have this kind of transmission this way, which acts as some kind of uh, transposition of the value matrices. So we have put and we have proj. We have a way to construct variable vectors, and that's all we need, in fact. So uh, it's a bit small. Yeah, it's really small. So if I write it to write something like I have, um, I have an array v, and I want to compute its inner product, what do I do? Well, I will start by, by um, I will start building a parallel vector as I call local which is built by basically computing the inner product of the local value of v. Okay? So v is a parallel vector of arrays. Okay? And locally, I compute the inner product of the local array stored into v. And when I do this, I basically use proj to send the local results of my inner product to everybody else. So every other processor has its own part of the product and all the other parts of the product from all its neighbors. And we finish by basically calling this 
into one value that computes the total uh, annual product. So we basically have this distributed construction there, followed by um, transmission step, and we finish by computing the rest of the uh, values. And there is something implicit there, okay? I didn't call any synchronization function, okay? Well, by design, the semantic of project put actually put a buyer after themselves. So they are, you are sure that when you exit from the put or the branch, you can actually use whatever has been projected or, or put into your memory. You may want to synchronize by hand, for example, with mostly with dealing when dealing with I/O and stuff like this. But usually, when you perform communications, the communications um, primitives do it all by themselves. So yeah, so three line. Okay. Now the question is, why is this? Well, it's rather compact. Small interface, strong concept. We have this notion of distributed vectors. We have this notion of functions that take some PID and give me a value that keep creeping out in all these examples. And everything is completely, well, all the parallelism is completely hidden into this two small uh, functions. So it's basically something we want to look at. And well, and BSML likes playing with lambda. There is a lot of example code. I didn't put more because it was a bit longer. Uh, but there is an example in the BSML doc where basically they solve some kind of Sudoku problems in parallel and it's something like 12 lines with 3 or 4 lambda functions printed on that. So, well, when you do a you like playing with lambda and well, we like it too, okay? So, well, okay, what about trying to make something in C++ that just looks like BSML with a very short interface that tries to capture all the good sides of this? and try to push the functional side of the stuff uh, using C++ functional items. So, well, how does it work? First, we need to start whatever the parallel program is. It's implicit in BSML, but in our cases, we need some boilerplate code. So we basically ask people to write not a main function, but a BSP main function. And everything starting from there is already in parallel. So we will write everything in this kind of function. And basically, there is a main somewhere in the library that basically takes care of starting whatever needs to be started. Okay, now, my first stuff is having these types that represent these distributed vectors. So, in a completely original way, we call this par. So, par of t is basically a BSP vectors of value of t distributed around the BSP machine. You can construct it from a lot of stuff and basically act as you want it to act. There is one small um, quirk, which is you cannot have a par of par of t. You cannot nest parallel distributed vectors in this model. There is BSP models that allow for nesting, but it's more an asshole than anything else. So we stick with the simple stuff. So how does it work? Well, basically, well, okay, I have some t which is basically called a different constructor all over the network. I can replicate the given value v by as you need constructing from there. Or if I have a function or whatever callable objects that match some integrals, whatever, I can pass directly the function there. And every element in the parallel vector will locally take its own PID and call the function to get whatever it needs to be initialized. And of course, when I say any callable object, ah, you can have lambda there, whatever Phoenix expression you want, row C, row C function pointers, whatever. As long as it matches this T of int um, protocols. And how do we access what there are is inside? So we tried out to get a dollar dollar operator in the C languages, we failed. So we went back with a good old reference operator to get access to the uh, local value. And basically, a par as well as act as an envelope, which means that if you have whatever um, uh, data structure in par and you want to access whatever methods we have this, you can just directly get this with the uh, pointer stuff access uh, operator. So basically, you can write, well, you can do this plus stuff, but we have the same shortcut that for the uh, thing in this. So we can basically build stuff like this, access the value inside, and do whatever computation. So now, how do we implement put and prod? So in Camel, they actually 
don't have anything to do because functions are actual values, okay, uh, like in most uh, functional languages. Well, in C++ it is not. I mean, you cannot return a value which is a function pointer or a function object or whatever. You have to go through all this scalable object system again. So what we have is that this stuff basically will return some kind of opaque types that basically act as a function and do whatever the result of project food should do if you are writing ML. And for better interoperability with whatever stuff we have in C++, well, there is few difference between a function taking an int and give us a value and an array. And in fact, there is few difference between something giving, taking an integer and giving me a value and a random access range. That's true. So, they act as a function and we make them act as ranges. So basically, what's going on? Well, let's do some simple example. I'm taking a parallel vector float and I fill it with this kind of lambda stuff. And I want to approach all this value. So I have some kind of result of approach of float, which is a value there. Give me whatever uh, the result is, and I call prod on that. Okay. Now, this stuff acts as a function. So I can basically ask, okay, what does machine one gives me as a value? Okay, well, it should give me one if everything is okay. So you can use this like that. But yeah, let's say I want to uh, um, display the value I receive from all of this. Well, I can take a begin and a hand out of this stuff and pass it to whatever uh, standard algorithm I want. Okay, so we basically do the um, operation stuff. Okay, so we can have this result of, of whatever there to get the results. I have another example, uh, this time with Spoot. Uh, in some cases, with Spoot is a bit more complex uh, because you could have uh, what the heck a real lambda function in OS, for example, or whatever complex lambda function going on. And the question is oh, yeah, I will write result of put, oh crap, what do I put there because it's a freaking complex type. So, well, in this case, we like to use this, we start moving on. Kind of side. So, well, basically, this we do whatever we need. And in this case of put, it's a bit different, but because what does put give us? Give us a parallel vector of function. Okay. So, if you want to know what PID1 sent to you locally, you have to get the local function using the dereference operator on the bar and then call the function. And this is also a range over the value you get from the transmission. So, Everything works uh, in this homogeneous way. So, how can I write an inner product using this? It's almost not that hard, okay? Well, there is a bit of practice because of all the um, range uh, value computation stuff. So, I take a range, and what I want to return is a value which is contained in the range. And what I do, okay, I have my, my power of this range, and I fill it by calling a function that will, for example, you have a huge vectors, and you want to slice it in different parts to put it on the uh, distributed uh, stuff, and I have a parallel vector that will contains my value. And what I say is that the local, my local value of R, well, it's basically the inner product, okay, of the range which is inspired, inside, in fact, stored there. And when I get this, what do I have in R? On each processes, I have the local inner product. And what do I do? Well, let's project it. Then let's accumulate over the range of the result I got there and put it back there. So in this program, what we have is that at the end of the function, every other uh, processes has the value of the inner product into R. Uh, it could be great if I actually return it. <laughs> but, well, you see what's going on. Okay, so that's basically what can be done. It's not that much uh, bigger. We just have to use whatever standard algorithm we may need, okay, uh, boost function, whatever. I mean, it's completely independent of what's going on to the parallel side. So now, how do we generate hybrid code with this? Well, as I said, we will just black box in the old style. So if you are, for example, pure MPI BSP code, you can have something like this. And then we have some super steps that do some computation, communication, and synchronization, and go on and go on. And what we will do is that basically in this function, at some point, we will jump into another BSP sub program in which 
we'll have another super step that will do the computation using OpenMP, for example, with optional as a copy of computation of sub-range uh, references. And when we're done with this, we just shut down somehow the local BSP of an machine and went back there. And basically, the only stuff we need to think about is, OK, I have some values there. How do I slice them back again uh, to work on the fire grain? But basically, well, it's not much at all. Let's look up like this. So this is the um, first level in the product stuff. What we have say, OK, I slice my input, I have my return value, I do, and I have to compute the local in the product. Okay, but this time instead of doing what I did just before, <coughs> well, let's call the uh, OpenMP version. And once I did that, I do my projection and I do my accumulation. And I'm still uh, forgetting to return the value, but whatever. <laughs> so now we jump over there. And the only stuff we have to say is that, okay, beware, uh, this is something you may want to start in the library uh, systems. I'm taking the sub-slice of my range there, okay, and I do the local in the product. And I create the results that I always forget to return then. And I end the I-write, the sub i write sections. And this is basically say, okay, depending on what you are trying to complete me with, I will figure out where you are in the hierarchy and what should I put into this stuff. Should I put some uh, OpenMP pragma or should I fire something else? <coughs> and basically, what did we do? If you look at the stuff, well, that's what's going up to the stuff. Is that this code basically ends up there, and there, except that this point has been replaced with whatever. So basically, we don't touch the communication parts, neither the initiation part. And only the computation step is actually modified there to call the local uh, hybrid system. And that basically means that if we have a way to say, okay, my function is this way, and when you see fit, you write, <coughs> I write it, it could be nice if we can automatically generate this kind of uh, oops. Yes? Um, in, in that example, you're slicing the input yeah. in the main inner product, but then you're slicing it again. Yeah, because what do I have when I am there? I'm seeing a slice of my input coming down from my, in my MPI node. Yeah. And I will enter an open MP section with, let's say, for example, 16 processes. And I have to find a way to say, OK, this huge block, I have to find a way to do all the way distribute it over the new level of my BSP machine. So it can be raw copies. Sometimes it's what we need. But sometimes we just have to say, OK, let's take some range of the stuff. OK. And in fact, there I take this easiest example where we actually do a copies. But we may have used something like ResultOf's um, slides there, and so we could have just sub ranges instead of doing copies. But actually, in our experiments, even if having sub range that doesn't perform any copies sounds appealing, there's a lot of places where actually you want to do copies, so you maximize uh, the locality of the, of the data inside each course, instead of having all the course trying to access the shared values. So either you do this, and you force a copy, as so though you put the, this result into the result of a flask and you get uh, the lazy evaluation of the sub -size. Yes? Well, syntactically, you've got par in both sections, but the slice functionality yeah. and the uh, representation of the parallel vector has to be different in each functional domain, different between MPI and OpenMP. How is that channeled into the mechanism? Basically, this stuff, I mean, the parallel vector is a range. Okay. So this fits yeah. this. Mm -hmm. But when you get there and you slice the input, uh, slice will recognize that you are passing a power of something and not some random ranges. And what we do uh, is so this I take the local value. If I slice, if I slice a power of a range, I do, some, I do the, local, the okay. logical stuff. Okay. Yeah. Slice is overloaded to do this. Okay. That's if, you, if, you, if you see a power of range coming in, uh, get the local range and slice on that and pass it to something else. Which is easy to get wrong if you... If you yeah, if you just write by hand or whatever. Okay. So basically you just put the stuff and the slicing is done as it should be based on the type you pass to the slice function. Mm -hmm. And either you put it into this so you get the copy or you put it into the result of slice to get the lazy evaluation. So basically, well, 
if I want, if I want it to be a bit, uh, well, if you squish your eyes really hard, it basically looks like the ML code we had before. Okay, almost. Uh, if I wanted to, if I wanted it to be this way, uh, basically we would need to have like some pros work directly on this result and stuff like that. It basically is the same. I mean, at the only part where the parallelism st starts leaking again. So at some point you have to say, yeah, beware, this function can be called into an embedded ways, okay, and take whatever precaution you need to do this. Uh, we are currently trying to get rid of this, but it's not that, well, easy. Uh, it involves having a call function there that takes care of this kind of stuff. But first version was basically looking like this, and get the job done. So now, okay, uh, that's all fine and then I have a way to a uh, right code that makes almost sense uh, and actually acts like the BSP program I wanted to have. Except that, well, uh, let's take the inner product uh, example. The complete application is basically three uh, super steps. The first super step just read whatever the data is from and split it into the uh, parallel vectors. The second super step is the stuff we saw, which basically computes the uh, results. And we have a third super step that basically save it again. Uh, somewhere or do something else with it. And now let's say we have a machine which has between uh, 2 and 60 MPI nodes and each node has between uh, 1, uh, I mean, can activate between 1 and 8 calls. Uh, what should I do? How many nodes should I use and how many calls should I use? And the question is depending on what. The fact is that it's completely depending on the size and the value of the data. Okay. But most, mostly the size. So, I admit defeat. There is something I cannot metaprogram to be found automatically. So, we have to find a way to get this out somehow. And so, the idea is to have some kind of offline program and say, okay, give me an XML description of your application. Basically, the list of super steps you want to run. For which super step you can use the name of a function, and then we try to find the C or C file containing this function in your uh, local path. Tell me how it is. Uh, sequences in the super steps and tell me what are the kind of communication you want to do and when you use put give me the function you want to use as put so I can fill it into some file. So we basically write a list of sequential functions we write the algorithm as an XML file and now we have to fill the blank. What do we need? Well basically what we want to do is basically applying the model, basically model stuff to uh, find out well if you tell me that you want to run this with that much element on this kind of machine you described me, okay, uh, for each super step I'm able to compute the time you would pass for a given number of um, elements to process and a given number of nodes activated with a given number of calls. And the question is, how many? Okay. So basically we build a graph <laughs> where each level of the graph is basically uh, the enumeration of all possible combination of how many nodes and calls can I start? Okay. And for each combination, we get an uh, offline database that contains a large number of system profiles that was done using benchmark or the, uh, <coughs> the Sphinx benchmark uh, systems. So that give us, okay, on this machine, your network goes that fast, your computation goes that fast, copying stuff goes that fast, etc., etc. And what we do is that we take the sequential function code, we feed it to clan, get the intermediate representation back into a string format, and we pass that, trying to find out where the instructions of the code are. And we try, because it's obviously uh, not possible in the general case, because it's basically an, um, an indecible problem, we try to find an estimation of the runtime uh, looking at the generated code. So sometimes, basically, when you do uh, HPC scientific code, it works because you end up with a bunch of uh, loop nest and stuff. So you can actually infer these versions. And in the case you can't, like you have an algorithm that say, okay, while uh, the value I am processing is not zero, I continue computing stuff. Well, there is no way you can find uh, statically the runtime of this. In this case, there is some things that say, okay, uh, your function stuff, I don't know what to do with it because I can't decide this runtime. So please, uh, give me yourself your estimation of the runtime depending on this and this value I actually found out. 
Uh, we have a small support for recursive functions, so basically, if you say something, okay, uh, I'm making parallel sort, for example. And parallel sort, when you write it in BSP, you say, okay, I'm locally sorting, then I'm shuffling pivot values, and I'm fin finally sorting all the pivoted values. And you, when you want to write it in a uh, hybrid way, what you want to call as a local sort in the first step is the your parallel sort itself. So you can actually use uh, the identifier of the program you are currently writing as a function inside itself. So you can actually recursively uh, embed the program into itself at different levels of parallelization. So we get this analysis done using this profile. We generate a huge graph and we give you an example afterwards. And we basically just try to find the lowest, uh, I mean, the shortest path through uh, the graph where the edges actually bind by the uh, runtime cost of each step. And when we have this, we basically look like that how many calls and nodes they have to start, uh, what are the functions, and I basically write, we basically write the uh, BSP++ call over all of this and generate a C++ call ready to be compiled. And basically this is a, oh, where is it? Oh, it's there. So basically this is the kind of graph we can end up with. So this is just uh, idle product. Okay. So it starts to be that big. So we make the first assumptions <coughs> that between super steps, if we have, for example, an MPI open MP machine, uh, we have the right to change the number of calls we use. Okay. But if I started my program with 16 MPI nodes, I will stay, I will stay with 16 MPI nodes the your stuff. So we have this kind of, you know, basically tubes of um, changing values over there. Each edge is basically bears for a given of number of elements you want to fill into this stuff, an estimation of the runtime, and we basically try to find the shortest one. And by going back, we basically find how many nodes should I start, and for each subset, how many calls, if any, should I start for this particular superset. And basically, uh, I think this is a small example. Uh, for example, in this, in this example, we find out that we can fire, uh, oh, I don't know, we need, it should be four. We can fire our four MPI nodes, but we don't need any, uh, firing any calls for this amount of data because it won't be uh, faster to get more. And we get another example which basically effectively, yeah, you, are, you want to go most number of nodes and the most number of calls because you have enough computing to do uh, to make it so. And for example, if I take the example of the parallel sort, we have some things that go like this, in fact, because depending on the part of the algorithm you want, when you do your local sort, you want to have the maximum amplitude of parallelism because this is a costly stuff. But when you are computing the pivot, which is just uh, selecting n elements in the array, you don't give a crap for doing this in parallel. So the framework gives us, OK, now we can go to one core because you don't need anything. And the last sorting part is done with a, a bit more cores. So this is done through these offline tools, and we basically end up with a ready-to-compile C++ file. So now, well, how does it go? So we went through different kind of applications to see well what was going on. So we have a couple of kernels which are rather trivial just to check if that really works or not, and a couple of applications, and we basically run this on well a four a 404 cores machine with ID processors, uh, up to 256 nodes from one of our French grid systems, and a cluster of three cell processors, yeah, because it was just hanging there. So we take two simple kernels. We have a stupid uh, matrix vector product okay, uh, that we run on the 16K by 16K matrices, and we re implemented. Map reduce the Google algorithms for uh, finding out uh, occurrence of words in text uh, over, I don't know what, I don't remember, over 1 billion words, or something like this. Okay. So, I read how it goes. Okay, for uh, MPI versus OpenMP. So, this is run on um, so four nodes, four cores machines. And what we want to say is, okay. Uh, people bitch about the fact that BSP barriers is costly. How much are they? And if you use OpenMP, which has a far faster uh, barriers, does it get better? Well, what happens? Basically, we compare 
the following one. We run 1, 2, 4, 8, or 16 um, process of these systems, either by looking at the 16 cores at a unique MPI machine, okay, that we fire up with 16 MPI daemon, or by looking at it as four MPI nodes using four cores using open MP. And that's it, oh no, sorry. With using open MP for the 16 cores. I'm already on the other side, on the other side. And basically, well, the stuff scales rather well. And what we see is at some point, well, the red bars basically contain the communication and uh, most of, in fact, the synchronization parts. And basically, it doesn't get much worse in open MP each time, but it starts to be effectively growing on the MPI. And basically, when we look at that, at some point, it ends up with that this communication part of the API is 80% uh, synchronization and only 12% uh, communication. And basically, um, experiment shows that the ratio between the barriers there in MPI and the barriers there in OpenMP is basically a factor of 20. So we, we synchronize 20 times faster using OpenMP. And this is case, well, it doesn't win that much, okay, uh, because I think the um, matrix is still too small. But, well, we have the impact of the synchronization far, uh, far further in the experiment and stay basically constant. The other stuff is basically doing the same stuff, but this time, uh, either we run all the calls using MPI or we split them up between MPI and OpenMP. Which means there we run four nodes, we run six, 16 nodes in MPI, and there we run four nodes in MPI, each of them running four calls in OpenMP. And basically, at the first, well, what, do, what does this mean? Well, we fire one MPI process with four OpenMP core. Well, not that good. And as time goes, we can see that the part taken into the communication and synchronization basically blew up in MPI and stay relatively small in the hybrid systems. And basically, well, uh, I was supposed to get percentage on these slides, but whatever. Uh, well, we are basically, yeah, three times faster uh, in the 16 course mod. And there is something you shouldn't see at some point, which is the cost of the copy between the, the two levels. And if you squish really hard, it's over there. Okay, but we, I think you barely see it as it scales. And basically, we found out that it was completely negative. Uh, nothing compared to the computation steps and the synchronization communications. So in this, in this case, we do copy. And in fact, I could have shown the other one. If we, instead of doing copies, we do just lazy uh, sub-slicing. Uh, this basically goes up to there. Basically, two times slower. Because every core is actually competing to access uh, the local shared uh, values of their small part. Yes. This is four nodes and four cores per node? This is four nodes, four cores per node using OpenMP, and this is all the four core four nodes, all started as a YOL 16 uh, MPI machine. So basically nothing new, MPI and shared memory systems has progressed to do, but well, we knew that, but actually we don't screw that much, because we basically have the same kind of results as we did it by hand. So basically on this simple case, we have a, nicely, uh, a nice gain compared to the naive MPI version stuff. And for MapReduce, it's a bit different. On the MPI versus OpenMP, we get far better results than the previous one, but we see that on MPI, quickly, a copy of a word by the, uh, the communication stuff. Mainly because of the reduce, okay, and this is our fault. Because we basically implemented the reduce part as uh, a logarithmic tree of reduce using a succession of puts. So we basically pay a lot of synchronization there. Okay. Uh, this is usually adverted in other BSP tools by having a special BSP reduce stuff you can use out of the box is that basically do an MPI reduce when it has to be. But the problem is that you are actually relying on the fact that the MPI implementation actually do the logarithmic reduce tree itself, which is may or may not be true depending on your implementation. And the OpenMP is still 
degrade nicely. And when you compare the MPI1 to the hybrid one, these times, we start seeing the yellow stuff going on. And if you look at this, well, you don't gain much than that. Because of what? Because I will say, this reduction stuff we have to write ourselves start really to be, even in OpenMP, start really to be uh, a mess. <coughs> and if you look at the computation stuff, well, it's basically the same thing at a few stuff. We are still faster on the MPI of an MP cases with 16 cores. Uh, well, just because we win a lot on the barriers. Yes. What is the approximate problem size? Because the time, so the, the time is yeah. pretty small. So I'm it actually is, wondering whether well, how much those. I think it's I think it's something like some millions words files. I, I I can check after. Yeah. Well, one would expect that it doesn't really scale to 16 whatever. So. Yeah. And it doesn't, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> but strong scaling is a desirable thing. Yeah. I yeah, mean, but then, but then you have to scale the problem size yeah, with the number yeah, of. Yeah. But that's that's weak scaling. That's weak scaling. That's easy just to get. What, what people are interested in is in strong, strong scaling. Strong scaling. Yeah. Is in is in being. But there, Amda will always pick you. We know that. What? Amda, because I'm then the sure. sequential part will dominate. It's impossible. If you've got any sequential part in your program, then you cannot get strong scaling. Yeah. With with message passing. With message sure. passing, you can't. No, in general. I, I in fact not. I <laughs> would I would tend to disagree. <laughs> you can actually. The problem is message passing. Well, we can discuss this afterward if you want. Well, if you've got problems which aren't connected, then you can get strong scaling. But those right. aren't the well. interesting problems. We <laughs> should <laughs> talk. We will talk about it later. Okay. So now we get to some kind of bit more uh, meaty uh, application. So we have a subgroup of our uh, lab that work on model checking. So model checking is a verification of properties of systems. Okay. And basically, this one of way of doing this is basically saying that a complex system, whatever it does is modeled as uh, Iden, well, a chain of Iden Markov's process. So we design, well, people in model checking design way of defining pr uh, systems as a set of um, Markov chain stuff. And what they want to do is being able to assess the properties of a time logic predicate of other models. Basically you say, okay, I have a system that controls the uh, exit door in a plane. And what I want to say is that when I closed it, it stayed closed until the alarm goes on, at which point I win that just after it's open. And so you describe all your system of the alarm, the stuff that take your door closed, and everything that works around that. And what you want to do on the system is say, is a predicate, when I close the door, it stayed closed, is true at, at some point in the future. Or if I ran the alarm, at the next time step, the door is open, and you want, we want to verify this. So this is usually a large problem, and when you do this manually, the uh, classical way of doing it, is basically a problem which is uh, p-space. So you will end up using a freaking lot of memory to try to solve even small uh, problems. And basically the most stupidest problem is, I think some of you know about that, it's, you know, it's a philosopher dinners. You know, if does anybody know, doesn't know what it is? I guess not. But you have a couple of, well, you have an odd number of uh, philosophers at the, ta at the table, and except they only have one pair of silverware distributed across this. So they have to wait for one of their neighbors to have finished eating so they can actually get the missing silverware <coughs> to be able to eat. And the question we have, given the number of, of philosophers around the table, is there a point in the future where everybody has eaten something. And this stuff with maybe a number of philosophers of 10 takes some, well, half a gigabyte of memory to be solved concurrently properly. And so there is people working on an approximate <coughs> way of actually um, solving these kind of problems. So under some, under some constraint on the form of the um, system modif modifications, we can actually run uh, something in Paris and say, okay, Try to verify this predicate uh, by following a random walk into the system's uh, state. 
So we basically uh, roll out random numbers to find how we can work down all the mapping chains that describe the models. And when I stop, because I listen so at randoms, I try to verify my predicates. And there is a, well, I should have put it there, but there is some bad stuff uh, that basically say uh, if you have this much random works with this much depth, uh, you are sure to get an approximation of your predicates at that much percent. And basically, uh, it turns, the, the P space problem is turned into uh, some regular huge polynomials problems. But it's only that far uh, approximate up to some fraction of percent. But usually when you are at 99%, you say, okay, it's, okay, it's correct. But if you're not, that means that, okay, I have to go back to the old versions of the resolution to see what's going on. But it basically can solve a lot of regular problems over this. So there is a parallel algorithm for this kind of approximations that basically will spawn out some kind of huge set of random works all over the systems and try to coordinate when uh, some of these branches actually found something so all the others can stop working on this and focus on the other one. And basically they all try together to get across the uh, random works uh, independent, as much as independently they can. And so there is some result we get. So um, this time we went over the grid, so we have up to uh, 256 cores, uh, which should be something like, um, how much was this? 64 nodes of four cores, something like this. Uh, yes. And we try to see what we show there. Uh, yeah, it's basically the way how the timing stuff goes on. And every, every row there, it's a different philosophers' uh, problem solved with different number of philosophers. Uh, state of the art uh, approximate model checking actually in sequential actually dies around uh, there, and we were about to get up to basically twice that that numbers. And when we compare the runtime of these systems to the end written NBI open NP graph, the the guy wrote before we went to this, we basically have the same runtime at some uh, milliseconds around. And another, yeah, and this is another um, uh, test, which is another model, which is a sensor network model. And the sensor network model, is some, which is another classical model checking problem, says that you have a grid of sensors, okay? And the grid is uh, this much by this much. So this is 25 by 25 sensors, 100 by 100, etc., etc. And in the middle of this sensor grid, you have an event, like a fire goes on or whatever. And the predicate you want to check is that, is there, in the short time in the future, any sensor which has on the border of the grid that gets the message that something happened in the middle. And what does each cell of the grid does when there's an event in the grid, it fires up in this connected label that something happened there. And each time step, the message will propagate. And the question is, does the system of propagation guarantee that Someone on the edge of the grid gets some message about what's going on inside. And basically, yeah, well, we basically have some kind of completely um, uh, flat uh, runtime stuff. And we basically go as fast as the end written versions, uh, except, well, we were able to go up to, four, uh, to 400, so the people with uh, manual MPI can, get, can do for whatever reasons. Uh, yeah, well, the code keep crashing for whatever reasons. <laughs> I blame MPI. <laughs> uh, but, and we get over with that. So, yeah. Why well, people interested, we have a paper in PDMC 2010 for all the details. And basically, we were about to scale over than 2,000 cores, uh, 200 cores, sorry. And uh, we get the surprise that basically we went able to run bigger problems at the end rate and prior version. So, well, we were quite uh, satisfied with this. And finally, the last algorithm we actually build up is, well, it's, the algorithm itself is complex with parameterization and other trivial. Uh, it's, it's an algorithm of comparing DNA sequences. Uh, currently there is two stuff to do this. There is some kind of heuristic method, so if there are anybody doing um, bioinformatics in the room, I actually apologize if I will say crap right now, <laughs> because, well, Yes, you had a question? No, no, I, I'm... Ah, yeah, you were saying, okay, okay, wow. So, 
If I remember correctly, there is the uh, fast but heuristic based method, I think it's BLAST. Right. Okay. And there is a direct method which is usually slow, which is the Smith and Waterman algorithm, which is actually able to get correct results for whatever the stuff. So we worked with um, some colleagues from the University of Brasilia, and basically, one of the ways to uh, handle uh, Smith and Waterman in parallel is basically doing the following thing. So, what does the algorithm do? You have two sequences of DNA over there, and you want to compute the distance between this stuff and this stuff. And the distance is basically, well, if I have the same basis, my distance is zero, and if the basis differs, um, in some way or another, I have the negative or the positive score, and if basically I don't match because the sequence is shifted, I got an even worse score uh, set to these cells. And basically, when you've got one cell done, and you want to compute the other one, it's a dynamic programming problem, you will have to combine the result from the cell up there and on your left and on your this way to get your results. And basically the algorithm is a huge waveform going on all these uh, rows. And how do we find the alignments, the best alignment stuff? You start from there and you walk down up the dynamic programming path up to get to the places where you match it. So it's rather huge, okay, especially when you have this huge amount of bases. And basically what we can do is basically we can partitionate this huge dynamic matrices and we'll run a front wave in each of these parts and what we have to do is synchronize the start of these blocks on the fact that I actually had enough data process so this one can start because it can find the data which is there and this one can find, it can start because it found the data which is there and so we have basically a system of, well we have some kind of uh, systolic loops going on over the passions that start everybody as um, everything is needed. So basically, well, the first processor we turn on this, the second one on that, etc., etc., etc. And there, if you have, for example, seven processors, the next block will be sent back to the first one, and we rotate like this all over the web front. If I didn't say anything wrong there, but it should, it should be like it works. Yeah, if my PhD student was there, you should be able to explain this better than me. And uh, basically what we did is running this on uh, one big basis, um, classical uh, stuff, I don't remember which one is it. Oh, it's not the chip, the chip is bigger than that, but whatever. So classical uh, uh, base that the basis. And basically we have a complete scaling of the old stuff. And in this case, in fact, going for a NP or MPI is basically, well, the same every time. Uh, mostly because uh, the runtime is uh, dominated by the communication, which basically takes the same amount of time, and we do far more, um, we have to do a bit more bias in OpenMP than the MPI to handle the web fronts, and basically everything is compensated like this. And when we compare with the hybrid version, it's basically the same. We want a few, we still scale. Uh, this is still the one megabase stuff. This is case. And in terms of uh, can we do better than that, we were actually able to run uh, this kind of algorithm with a huge uh, only know I think this one's a 1G one base uh, sample. I don't remember which is this. There is 1G base uh, stuff, I don't remember. Uh, so we were able to run this too because compared to the end version that was crashing too because of, I guess, a wrong MPI or OpenMP stuff. <laughs> so, well. And this is well, and the actual stuff is that um, well, it's, it's something which is difficult to quanti to quantify. But uh, the whole uh, DNA comparison stuff was done with one of the bioinformatic guys that came visiting us and our PhD students. And the your call was done in less than one week, and we spent the next three weeks actually doing the benchmarks and waiting for the uh, result to come down. Uh, and as, at the same time, the other side of the uh, Brazilian team were actually making the same stuff by end, and they basically end up with a working version of the first MPI stuff when we are actually finishing the benchmark stuff on all the versions of the code. So, well, it's worth what it's worth. Basically, we can actually com uh, well, compute as fast as we should, but it's as also easier to uh, actually walk around the, uh, the amount of time you need to code the stuff. So all in all, it's also some kind of factor. So and as conclusion, so well, uh, we have this strange uh, old uh, programming model uh, that looks bad on the paper. 
because uh, yeah, every two lines we speak about buyers. But in fact, well, could be implemented in a somehow efficient way uh, with some kind of nice looking interface where people doesn't have to do much stuff expect, except uh, thinking about the ways data should move around. We have this black box eyebrow support that actually help us building blocks of uh, hybrid code. It's rather usable, uh, pe random people can actually use it. And it scales on a non uh, trivial number of uh, non trivial pro uh, programs. Uh, there is a fairly new version of, the, uh, of this hanging out on this GitHub repo. Uh, it still has to be polished, uh, like docs and stuff. Uh, but the core, the core system is there. There's a couple of examples that should compile uh, without any um, problem. And if not, I know who I will uh, more or less when I come back. <laughs> we have the generator, which is not in the internet. We have to push it up soon. Uh, that helped us going over this. Okay, what kind of operation? Uh, what kind of operation should I put where? And well, we played around with integrating the Clang lib into Boost then having this. Uh, I'm reading a boost graph using the result of the call to this claim lib stuff that was passed using spirit and shit. Yes? Now, is this the sort of framework that could be extended to generate um, code for other parallel models? Yes, yeah, that's what we want to do, in fact. Trying to find stuff where we have a way to get some kind of performance model out, because if not, it doesn't really work. And try if we can actually do the same crap by just having some kind of plugin stuff and say, okay, here is a condition model you should use, and here is how you should handle the choice between mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Oh, yeah, I know, sense. <laughs> so it has to be extended, yeah. This way, and another way which is basically, uh, can I actually have more than two levels of hybrid systems? We're currently integrating uh, the cell processor inside. We started looking at GPU, but as I will say just after this, <coughs> yeah, there is a question. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, you, could you speak a little bit more about the Boost Clang interface? Do oh. you have code for that? Uh, yeah, we have code for that. We have to push it, but basically what we did is that we wrote some kind of uh, there is two parts. We wrote some kind of clan uh, runtime plugin for the compiler that basically had a phase in the compiler that basically give us all this uh, intermediate representation we needed. And this stuff was actually loaded with lib, I think it was like libvm and libclan, so we can get the intermediate representation back into something we can work on it, get the intermediate representation into a, a form we can work on that, do some passing on whatever is going on, and get some information. And, uh, do you have the code for that? Is where can we find that? Uh, we will have to push there next to this. It has to be pushed. Okay, so it, we'll it will be it. over okay. there somehow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Under what heading or something? Clang or something? Uh, sorry. What? Where, where, how, how will we find it? Just find his GitHub. Oh, just his GitHub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it will okay. be there. And if it's not there, it will be originally at something like slash bspgen. But anyway, I think I will send right. a mail or maybe this at some point or whatever. Okay. And so we are trying to put more architecture in this. Uh, we had a support for the cell, which is already done with the stuff that we will speak about just after. Uh, and we are trying to look into uh, GPU stuff. The basic is the problem is that if we want to have something that I actually write in one single C++ code, I need to have a way to regenerate this uh, GPU kernel at runtime, time, fill it inside, and get back into the code. Uh, it kind of works, but it's not, uh, well, I'm not satisfied with the root of it. And, in fact, I told you there was some problem going on at some point. The question is, uh, can we push completely uh, the slice of the functional versus imperative systems all back down to functional? And basically, can't we create some kind of phonics tree extension systems that basically uh, give us a BSP primitives of the new phoenix keyword? And what do we do with this? Well, when I actually uh, Evaluate the Phoenix, a BSP Phoenix version stuff. Well, I'm just putting all the co normal code uh, normally, and when I end up on a BSP primitives, I will generate whatever is needed to uh, perform this. And why do we want to want that? There is something I didn't talk about in the BSP model, which is what we call the super step merging. Sometimes you are two super step, one after the others, and in fact, well, they are completely independent in their computation steps, and you are paying too much buyer for nothing. So in BSML, there is something which is called super, that takes two super steps, and there is a communication and the computation of both, and only generate one uh, buyer synchronization. And to do this, we can do this right now in the way we actually handle the code, because 
There is no way I can access random function code like this directly from the, the compiler. So the idea is that if I can actually write some stuff like super step S equals some huge phonics 3 lambda function using BSP keyword, and super step P equal another one, and I want to say, okay, now I want to do merge of S1 and S and P and get the uh, optimized uh, super step out of that. It actually also helps solving the multi-stage problem, problem, problem because I can actually say, okay, there is a way you, I want you to evaluate this phoenix expression into, for example, a your new C++ code into a, a string I send to some kind of JIT or runtime compilers and give me back the stuff. Uh, but the problem is that, can we actually ask every people to write lambdas everywhere? I think the answer is not yet. Uh, <laughs> but it's something we are actually going through, uh, trying to get some kind of pushing the functional uh, pool up, down the way uh, to this, and trying to get something that actually makes sense comparatively to the original uh, functional implementation. And that's something we wanted to do for a long time, but the perspective to having to rewrite the equivalent of Phoenix using Proto and adding our stuff was a bit daunting. So when Phoenix 3 get out, say, oh, okay, so now we can do it because all the funky stuff is already done. So, <laughs> well, so we are heading towards this. I don't know what's going to come out of that. Uh, I suspect uh, freaking new combined times, that's for sure. Uh, but the, the impact of the usability and the readability of the code has still to be assessed. Uh, so we have to see what's going on into this kind of mixed, you know, uh, functional implemented systems and having this optional uh, multi-stage code generation systems. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>